Um, okay, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Head Up and Life Sciences. We are, uh, as I mentioned a little bit in the introduction, this is a, a company that came out of the University of Minnesota, technology that came out of the University of Minnesota, and we had licensed this from the university and are um, building upon this. We are a, a drug development company uh, and specifically in the area of antimicrobial. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but just in terms of setting up the problem, um, if I'm sure you all have been paying attention to or have heard in the news about the issues around bacteria becoming antibiotic resistant. Uh, that's a real huge problem. Um, and there is there's a definite lack of um, other uh, alternatives or alternative drugs in order to deal with these, these uh, multi-resistant uh, bacteria that are developing. Um, if you if you go to the doctor and you receive a, an oral antibiotic, <clears throat> uh, what you will find out from that is it kills it kills more than likely the bacteria that they're giving you the drug for, but it kills a lot of other bacteria as well, which isn't necessarily a good thing. Um, and as far as a priority, uh, the WHO, World Health Organization, the UN, the FDA, this is all on their radar screen. They're all quite concerned about the fact that the antibiotics that are out there today are causing drug resistance in the bacteria, and then you have these superbugs that are developing from this. So that's the problem that we are addressing. Um, our company, HLS, Hennepin Up in Life Sciences, is, is about developing a novel antimicrobial that doesn't cause drug resistance, so meaning the bacteria cannot um, mutate around the drug, um, safe and efficacy. Effic efficacious. So safety and efficacy are kind of the two, um, if you will, table stakes to, to play in the, in the drug business. It's, it's got to be safe and it's got to be effective. First safe, secondly effective. That's kind of the way FDA looks at it. Um, the, the drug that we have is uh, local or topical. And when I say local or topical, think of it's got to be delivered directly to the site of infection. Topical, that's pretty easy. Local, that's a little bit more difficult. Um, so another way to put that is swallowing a pill of this drug would not work. It's got to be delivered directly to the site of infection. Um, I don't know if there's any scientists in the room, but um, the fact th this is a bit unusual in that it, it deals with bacteria, uh, both gram positive and gram negative, and that's that's unusual. Again, you may not know what's, what's the difference between a gram positive and gram negative, but gram negatives are the, the bacteria that folks are most concerned about. The poster child for gram negative is E. coli, um, and you know, you've heard about that getting into food sources and, and the like. Um, yeast and fungi, we also impact as well as viruses. So that's very unique. Any antibiotic out there today strictly treats bacteria and more than likely strictly gram positive. So this, this is a bit different. Um, and we have uh, strong IP that we developed from the University of Minnesota, or rather licensed from the University of Minnesota, and then we are building on that technology as well with additional IP. Um, and there is also a fairly strong regulatory position that we have with this product. And I can get into more details on that if you'd like. Um, this is an attempt to give you kind of an idea of how this works. So a typical antibiotic uh, gets inside this, the cell wall and kind of um, works to kill various items within the bacteria itself. So if you remember back to your early biology days, mitochondria, as a, for instance. So some of the bacteria might attack the mitochondria, kill the mitochondria, and then the, the bacteria dies. Well, eventually you develop this loop that's called the drug efflux, where the bacteria figures out how to kick the drug out. Um, what is different about ours is we actually embed in the wall of the, of the bacteria. And because we embed in the wall, it, it eliminates the, the cycle of communication, feeding, replication. So in simple terms, um, what we tell folks is think of this as a, as a condom for the bacteria. It cannot replicate, and bacteria live through its progeny. Uh, bacteria, a single bacteria cell has a fairly short life. It lives through its progeny and reproducing. If it can't reproduce, it will die. Um, so, uh, in terms of where we are in our pipeline, we have three different disease states that we're focused on. 
I'll spend a moment on this just so you understand. So the first uh, bacterial vaginosis, if you're familiar with yeast infection for women, this is a bacterial infection. And it's as common as, as a yeast infection, just probably a little less known in the general public. Um, what is unique again about our drug is it will kill both. Um, the second area that we are looking at is urinary tract infection, which is a very common infection. Urinary tract infections usually lead to um, um, the number one cause, rather, of hospital-acquired infections. Um, and then finally, sexually transmitted diseases, specifically we're focused in on, on herpes. Um, and uh, there is a gonorrhea-resistant uh, strain of bacteria out there today that we're focused on as well. So um, just a moment on, on the, the BV part. We are in phase two trial. If you're not familiar with the drug development, there's three phases. We're in the second phase. Um, this is being funded by NIH. Our study is being funded by NIH. Um, and if you don't know how NIH works, that's highly unusual. Um, what they will do is generally give you funds uh, pre-commercial. Oh, I'm sorry, pre-phase pre one. But they are so excited about this that they've actually funded the study. And that's about a $3 million study that's, that the NIH is paying for. Actually, all of you are paying for it. So thank you. Um, and, but the good news is that that's uh, very, uh, from, from our perspective, it's, it's non-dilutive cash that really helps to build our business and, and get it forward. Our long-term plan, um, and this is the management group, we can talk more about this if you like. Our long-term plan is to get this molecule on the backside of phase two and to license this to a pharma company, uh, preferably a big pharma company that can take this into phase three and then in, into commercial use. So uh, this is our management team. With me is Mark Robbins. Mark, raise your hand um, right here. And um, Mark and I, he, he said, we've worked together for a number of years. Uh, we both have uh, over 30 years experience in the pharmaceutical business. So I'm probably over my six minutes, but am I good? Yes, you're good. OK. Um, so is this the, the Q&A part? Yes. OK. We always like to ask each of our presenters what it is that the one million cup community can do for your business. Sure. Well, so we um, we are in in a fundraise right now. We're actually looking to wrap up our fundraise here in the next uh, say thirty to sixty days. Uh, our fundraise is for one point five million. Uh, that's to get us through the next two years. Uh, of that one point five, we have about one point two of that circled uh, and. There's wood uh, that should be coming in by the end of this week. Um, and so one of the things that we would be interested in is if there's directions uh, that you can point us towards um, uh, funders that we should be talking to, that would be great. Um, also, probably more importantly, how does this presentation sing to, uh, to potential funders? And you know, I'm guessing not everyone in the room, or few of you in the room, or maybe scientists. Is this does this make sense? Um, and part of the, the community that we will be going to may not be scientists. So we want to make sure that this is relevant, makes sense, and is translatable into something, some action that they would be successful at. That's a great uh, point to present because oftentimes our presenters need to refine their talk so that people, lay people, may understand a more technical issue or science. Are there any questions that people have about understanding? Let me bring the mic around so that we can uh, record your audio for the camera. Uh, nice presentation. Thank you. Have you done any studies on to, um, how the bacteria are being able to avoid the antibiotics and uh, does food and nutrition and processed food have anything to do with um, what's going on? Uh, let me make sure I understand your question. The question is how this is affecting the bacteria? No. Um, any studies on why the bacteria are mutating like they ah. are and avoiding you know, the antibiotics that we're giving them? Because I, I do understand that's a big problem yep. in the world. Yep. And is it in any relation to food and, and the food system? Uh, I. Mark, I don't know if you have a, a sense on that. Mark's the, the, the scientist and I'm not. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe it's, I'm not a scientist, so I probably shouldn't expound on that, but my, 
from, from what I've learned from our scientists that are involved in this, uh, Marty Peterson and Pat Schlievert, that's not really the, the issue so much as the, the food source. Um, it's really more the, um, go ahead. So, so bacteria mutate. If, if you sit there, as Tom pointed out, it's the progeny that, that do that. And when you give them your conventional antibiotics, they, some will escape, and the ones that escape are resistant, they'll grow larger populations. That's why there's a huge resistance now from physicians to prescribe line antibiotics. In the food sources, there used to be antibiotic contamination there, so now you had ex bugs exposed to these antibiotics in the food sources, and the ones that um, existed that could pass through that were mutating and they developed resistance mechanisms where they could either get rid of the antibiotic in the system or they had other enzyme systems that could bypass that pathway. This technology is quite a bit different in that it stabilizes the membrane and the communication, but it doesn't involve, involve any of the um, cellular-based mechanisms that they can escape from. Does that answer that question? Hold the mic. Sorry, Mike. Uh, a couple things for you to understand uh, about our team. So Pat Schlievert and Marnie Peterson, these are the two inventors. Uh, they were both at the University of Minnesota when they invented it. They have both left the University of Minnesota. Pat is now at Iowa, University of Iowa. And uh, Marnie has actually moved on to the University of Wyoming. Um, Pat Schlieffert, if you looked up his name, if you Googled his name, you'd find thousands and thousands of articles that he has written. He's, he's quite prolific. If any of you remember uh, when toxic shock was a big deal a number of years ago, this was the guy that actually identified the toxin and identified what was happening with, with these women uh, from tampons. And so he's quite well known in the, in the microbiological world. So this is a, a process that's that's patented. Is that so? Um, there's there's a couple different patents. Um, the the one patent that we have is a formulation patent. Uh, there is also a patent specifically to the disease states that we're going after. Okay. And um, it's smart enough to discern the the bacteria that it's it's targeting. It's actually targeting bacteria. Uh, certain type? Yeah. Mark would be a better scientist to answer that question. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't specifically target bacteria. So it will, it will also hit mammalian cells and, and other cells. The reason why it targets bacteria is because bacteria are rapidly producing. The bacteria don't produce, they die. If your, your mammalian cells, your, your cells that you're made up of, they're not reproducing in that pathway and they don't die off. And so by stabilizing that membrane in, in the human cells or in the mammalian cells, it has really no impact and it, 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 it wears off over time. But with bacteria or anything that's highly rapidly producing that needs to reproduce in order to keep living, it will kill those off. And that's that's the, why it's specific for the bacteria. Does that address your question? Okay. Uh, so I think, I mean, this is a big problem and I, there's a fair amount of people working on it. Can you talk about, um, quote, the competition or mm -hmm. other things that are being worked on that, that might um, negatively affect or, or surpass you know, what you're working on? Yes. Um, so uh, as far as in the specific disease state we're in, um, there, there are no other drugs that I'm aware of and looking into the, um, you, you can go on, on the government website and see what drugs are being developed. Uh, there's no drug that I'm aware of uh, or that is published that is going after this disease state that has the same drug resistance profile that we do. There is a, a, a drug that will likely be approved in the next year or two, which is a kind of a traditional old antibiotic that's being repurposed for this 
specific disease state, BV. Um, it doesn't kill yeast and it is oral um, and because it is oral it will kill other bacteria as well. So the, the competitive landscape here is not, uh, it, it's good for us I guess in that sense. The drugs that are out there today, the gold standards, um, there's a drug called metronidazole, 3M back when they had a pharmaceutical company that was their drug and uh, the effectiveness on their package insert, if you were to read that, no one reads those, but uh, is somewhere between 30 to 50 percent. So pretty low kill rate. Um, we believe, and again, the test will need to prove this out, but we believe we'll be in the 70 to 80 percent category. A couple of comments. Um, I, I, I agree with the competition um, needing needing to be addressed somehow. Just a you know a slide kind of talking about whether there is or any isn't anybody in that space. The other point, um, as you started out, I, I like your definition of the problem and the way you're attacking it and the size of your market. Um, but I kept on wondering who's Tom, and oh. you brought it up at the end. And your management team and I think I got a quick glimpse of had advisors too are very impressive and I'm not sure if they need to be reordered to be at the front end or if you maybe need um, maybe a, a little bit more of a, um, given the six minutes you, you had, you, you have to kind of pick and choose, but but I would hammer home how important your, your people are, you know, who's, who's developed it, um, what your specific background in is, if you've got some specific companies that you can refer to, sometimes logos help, um, but the, the management and the um, advisors in this space are, are critical as opposed to, you know, we're a bunch of uh, academics that have created this process and now we're going through some, some you know, early stage testing. We've actually got patented technology, we've got an NIH uh, grant that you're um, working on for the development. Yep. Um, so I think that's, you know, just as far as basics that you need in your, in your pitch deck. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, I guess just from a question standpoint, is phase two of an NIH similar at all to FDA um, uh, phases, phase trials? Yes, so good question. By the way, thanks for the feedback. That's very helpful. Um, so it, it can be confusing. There is uh, an NIH or an SBIR is referred to phase two grant. Um, that is, shouldn't be confused with an FDA phase two grant. Or, or I'm sorry, phase two clinical study. What we have is the FDA phase two clinical study. That NIH is funding, which is unique. Yeah, good, good clarification. So the <clears throat> most impressive part, the thing that really captured my attention as a layperson, and I, I, mean, I have a very cursory understanding of the difference of you know, oral and topical and you know just the basic understanding it was when you mentioned the NIH uh, funding, which was unusual. You said this is, you know, usually they'll do the funding at this stage, but not here. And you know, somebody who's in this space as an investor will probably understand that. And that would, you know, they would understand the, the value that, that, that they've placed on your product. But if you could have that sort of uh, come out maybe earlier on in your presentation and, and share sort of the gap that is being covered with this invention mm -hmm. and why this is, you know, a sort of a, a, an innovation that is, going to rock the world of, you know, BV mm -hmm. and be, you know, I, you got the idea, but just sort of the, um, how, what, what kind of a leap is this? And maybe have that, you know, be sort of a, a little more of a punch to it, like you said, because that, that was really what captured my attention, like, whoa, okay. So now I can kind of understand that this has got some, you know, attention from NIH that's obviously unusual. And, uh, but if you could have that sort of more of that rather than just this is a good product we believe in it but man it sounds like this is really innovative an invention really capitalize that more i would suggest yeah great great feedback thank you very helpful you know i kind of got the impression that this is a product driven idea before it was i didn't really communicate what the market was and so i probably reorder your slides a little bit to identify this is the market size and you've got you know four million or two million one million maybe there's some other I'm sorry billion uh, and then drill that down a little bit what kind of market share out of that 
you know, $7 billion market does this product address? And if you do that earlier in your presentation, a person's going to be able to discern, I want to play in that space. Okay, and I think that this product has got a 20 share. Therefore, they capitalize and they say, I got a few other ideas. I got a $10 billion category and I can capture 2 billion of that over time. All of a sudden, now I size the opportunity. Mm -hmm. I think if you do that early in your presentation versus late in your presentation, it gets people either excited or say, I'm not part of that space. So they do the newspaper article Okay, I'm not going to read the rest of it because I'm not interested. And then I would hit it pretty hard quick instead of going to the product, hit your management team because products get tweaked and changed if you're building a company. If you're just licensing the product, then keep it in the order that you have by focusing on the product because your objective is to license this with a major pharmaceutical that's got worldwide distribution. So it really depends on your objective. I didn't really understand if your objective was to build a company, but that doesn't sound like it really is. You're basically going to license it out. Overall, I think it's great. Thank you. Uh, great feedback. And that you're right. That is not clear in the beginning. That what our intent here. What's a, what's the business plan, right? I was a little slow on the uptake. Sorry. I was a little slow on the uptake, and I'm okay. trying to pin down exactly what the advance is here. Are you? Uh, do you have a an agent that will selectively uh, prevent certain bacteria from replicating, while the other bacteria in the gut are not destroyed? Yeah, and maybe I'll, I'll let Mark answer that again. But the question, what, what I think what Mark is, is stating, and I'll allow him to restate it, is that, that the bacteria that, that you know, were attacking, they replicate very quickly. Um, and so these, with, with this embedded in the cell wall, is eliminating that ability for it to replicate and therefore it dies off. But I'll allow you to address that. Yeah, so this does not, one, there's no exposure to the gut of this agent because it's given locally. So for bacterial vaginosis, it's given in the vagina, it's put in there. And what it does is it kills off the bad bacteria because they're out of control, they're overgrown, the flora is out of control. And what we're looking at part of the clinical study is, does it reestablish a healthy microbiome back in the vagina? Um, it does not kill off the lactobacillus, which is a good bacteria that you want to have in there, and it should allow it to grow. The other point, and this, this is part of the breakthrough, is when you um, have bacterial vaginosis and you kill off the bacteria, you kill off all, all the bacteria from the antibacterial in there, it lets yeast grow in there, and so you, get a, you get a yeast infection. This also has anti-yeast, so you avoid the yeast infection, and so it, it should really establish a healthy flora back in the vagina. Does that answer that question? Yeah, thank you. I think it's an important point because as consumers, yeah. we're all consumers, uh, we don't necessarily want to take an antibiotic that's going to destroy all the bacteria in our body, and that's been the option that we've had. Yeah, thank you. And just uh, so a follow on on that, and, and this maybe was uh, not maybe it was missed in the presentation in terms of my presenting it. This is a gel that you would insert. It's not a not an oral drug. If that helps at all. Yeah. Okay, so you've addressed the phase two. Do you have a realistic timeline that goes all the way to return on investment for the investors? I mean, revenue, profit, return on investment, a realistic timeline? Uh, we do. Uh, I don't have it in this deck, but uh, our, our time frame is that our phase two study will be finished by the end of 2017. Uh, and, and the data collection after that is probably another six months. So call it mid-2018 would be the decision point or inflection point for this business. So the decision point being uh, looking to find a partner to either uh, sell, license, or co-develop. 
uh, in, into phase three. We have and, time for And this may not be the question you're asking, but yeah. phase okay. three. I get it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We have time for just one more question here. Yeah, it's not financial one. So uh, I have actually two questions. First, is it possible to use this as a cancer treatment and about the toxicity of this treatment? Uh, toxicity was your last question? Yes. Okay. Uh, cancer, I don't think so. I don't, Mark, I can't imagine that it would, uh, would have an impact there because it's, it's a very different, that would be a very different mechanism. Um, as far as toxicity, um, another question that may fall in line with what you're asking is, is safety. That's, they're kind of synonymous. Um, the, the odd thing about this particular molecule is uh, you could go out today and buy a 50-gallon drum of this if you wanted to. Um, it is a, uh, a commonly available molecule. There is a secret sauce, thus the IP, in terms of, of putting this together and, and delivering it in the way that we deliver it. And that's what the IP is around, and 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 then the use for it. Um, the, uh, the the chemical itself is actually in breast milk. So when you think of a, a child who you know on breast milk, there you you hear that you know they're, they're gaining a lot from their parent, from the mother rather, in terms of of protection. Um, that's part of uh, the molecule that we have here is what is being transferred to the child. Does that answer your question? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for the input.